Hello and welcome to the Department of Healthcare Access and Information or HCI 2022 CBSC Triennial Code Cycle Updates pre presentation brought to you by the Building Standards Unit here at HCI. As you may know, California amends its building standards every three years, so hold on tight and prepare to learn more about the changes that have been made to the 2022 California Building Standards Codes. This is the second part in a three-part section or session of the CBSE series. And today during pre this presentation, we're gonna go over the fire and life safety updates to the 2022 CBSE and CFC codes. If you haven't done so already, please feel free to download the presentation uh, in PDF format under the handout section of this uh, go to toolbox. Uh, and so you can go ahead and follow along during the presentation as we go through it. We are here for about two hours, uh, so hold tight. If you have any questions, we're gonna try to get to questions at the end, but uh, if we don't, send your email or your questions in an email over to the regs unit at hki.ca.gov, and we will be able to answer those questions at that time. So again, to repeat myself, I'm gonna go ahead and let you know that we are not uh, gonna have time to answer questions at the end of this presentation like we typically do. So send your email over to regs unit at hki.ca.gov, that's R-E-G-S-U-N-I-T at hki.ca.gov if you have questions about this presentation. So again, uh, feel free to send that email. Keep your questions specific to this presentation. Or if you have questions about something else for a specific project or a specific issue, we'll be able to help you with that as well. So send your email whenever you get a chance. Today for a presenter, we have Ms. Nancy Timmons. She is a Chief Fire and Life Safety Officer here at HCI. So Nancy, if you're there, uh, the presentation is all yours. Thank you very much, Caesar, And thank you everybody for joining. Appreciate you taking the time for this. I know that the, uh, the flyer indicated that this was the update for CBC and CFC for fire life safety changes. Uh, as you can see from the handout, this this is a fairly significant in size. It is pared down from the um, presentation that I have that includes all all changes. So I tried to take out what what you well, I guess you need to know it all. But <laughs> uh, what I've tried to put, leave in what was most imp important or most applicable for healthcare facilities here. Um, and some of the other changes that I took out are kind of minor. You know, if you see you're looking for a section that you know is there but you can't find it, it may, it may have moved. Those types of changes I didn't in, include in this presentation. Uh, the, again, this is pared down a bit but still large. And that being said, that it is the, these are the changes for CBC. We will probably set up another presentation for the CFC and uh, present for that presentation should be a little shorter than this one because as you're probably familiar with, some of those chapters are repeated from what's in the building code, but there are there's a lot of new information in CFC that I would like to share with you. So we're going to focus on the CBC fire life safety changes. And it's the, these are the changes not only from SFM and OSHPOD or HKI, whatever you want to call us, uh, but also model code changes. So as you can see in this title page up top, you see the three the three symbols. So well, you don't see OSHPOD technically, but that's because I write when I write the changes, it goes through SFM. Uh, so there are SFM changes that are SFM, but also th that are Osh pods that we gave to SFM. Anyhow, so when you see these symbols, you'll see them throughout the slides. It just gives you an indicator of where those changes came from. Not super important, just more important to know the changes are there. <laughs> but if, if you're curious, that's where they came from. All right, so we're going to go through, uh, I will skip through some slides, but they're at least there in your handout for you to look look over those so that you you know of their the awareness there. So we're going to start off with the, sorry if my slides, there we go, progress there. The typical, you know, do we go in the order of the of the code. So chapters one and two are your admin 
sections and there's i don't know this is almost expected every three years <laughs> where the definition of atrium changes just a little bit uh the the enforcement of this the, the wording shuffled around a little bit but the definite the um enforcement of it hasn't changed so now it reads a vertical space that is closed at the top connecting two or more stories and i in I-2 and I-3 occupancies or three or more stories in all other occupancies. So just making it more clear than previous editions that an atrium and an I-2 is two stories and that we'll get into that later, but that also means you can need smoke control and all of that, uh, but in, and in I-3s. But in other stories, it's an atrium once it's three or more stories. Change of occupancy, it, There's this is a new definition of, as you can see in the, the symbol on the bottom, this is a model code change. And yes, I apologize, but I'll be reading you code, but I'll be talking about it too. So I usually start with reading it and then explain it a little bit, but either way you should get both. So change of occupancy, either of the following shall be considered as a change of occupancy where this code requires a greater degree of safety, accessibility, structural strength, fire protection, means of egress, ventilation, or sanitation than is existing in the current building or structure. So the either, well, either of the following, number one, any change in the occupancy classification of a building or structure, and then any two, any change in the purpose of or change in the level of activity within a building or, or structure. So what is that intent for? The intent of those revisions, it's uh, to limit the application of a change of occupancy where there's no change in classification to only when new uses present a higher risk to the life, safety, or welfare of the occupants than was created by the previous use. So you can also see a change that is OSHPOGS or HPIs is 1224.3. We have a, def we have a def definition for change in function. It's similar to that. But again, I'll go backwards. Uh, but change in occupancy is not model code has more specific language for change of occupancy here. A penthouse, they've included stairways in the uh, for penthouse as long as the uh, as long as the stairways are in compliance with 1511, which it, when you go to CBC 1511, that's the section that will indicate if you have more than a third of that rooftop, if there's structures more that cover more than a third of that rooftop, that rooftop is now considered a story. Uh, so, but what this is saying is, again, not a huge change and it's something that you've been doing all the time, but they just added it into the code that stairways can be considered a, a penthouse as long as it's in compliance with 1511. Uh, one other thing I should add is when we're when I'm going through this presentation, please remember these are just the changes. So you, you're going to see portions of the of the code sections, and bits and pieces of it. Please don't forget to you we always say keep reading, read above, read below, read the whole code section when you're looking at this on your own. Uh, read the whole section to have it make more sense. For this, we're just obviously just going through the the changes. We're not going to read all of the sections there's there are definitions for fire retardant treated wood there that also isn't that's not necessarily new they're just making it clearer there's a difference between fire retardant treated wood and preservative treated wood so fire retardant treated wood are wood products that when impregnated with chemicals by a pressure process other or other means during manufacture exhibit reduced surface building characters and resist propagation of fire. So impregnated by, so when you have a project that you've got fire retardant treated wood on, uh, remember to go to chapter 20, I think it's 23, excuse me, with a wood chapter, I forget which one it is, but make sure to go there and make sure you're using the right kind of fire retardant treated wood and how it's tested and listed, um, not only where you, if you can even use it and where it's applicable, but impregnated versus sprayed. So you wanna make make sure that it meets the requirements of the code, of course, um, but that's one key is that it's impregnated and not sprayed. And then preservative treated wood are wood products that 
when impregnated with chemicals by a pressure process or other means during manufacture, exhibit reduced susceptibility to damage by fungi, insects, or marine borers. Complete, you know, they're different. So to make sure you're using the right type, <laughs> fire retardant treated wood, not the preservative treated wood, they're both gonna say impregnated, but make sure that it's the right, it meets the right testing requirements of CBC in your wood chapters. And you'll see a label something like this on there. This is just an example. It's not primary structural frame. Again, just a little bit of cleanup with it. The, the main definition hasn't changed. What has changed is in item number four, the references to bracing was deleted from the definition of primary structural frame. And why are we talking about this in fire life safety? Of course, is we what are we what needs to be protected of the primary and secondary members? What has to be protected? And in to order to figure out what has to be protected, you got to know what you're looking at. Uh, so this is why we bring it up here. But again, the main change in in the definition is removing bracing from item number four. So that number four now reads members that are essential to the vertical stability of primary structural frame under gravity loading. And then just some explanatory language. When you see the language in blue like this and blue font, that's just uh, us explaining it a little bit more for you. So primary structural frame members must be essential to carrying gravity loads. Any member or component that is essential to the vertical stability of the building under gravity loads is to be classified and protected as part of the primary structural frame. The definition is intended to also apply to bearing walls, which are assemblies rather than single components. So it, it does, it, that's like a reading behind the, the words of the code. It does apply to those as well, to the bearing walls. And just some visuals to help out as well. So if you've got, uh, in this case, the, the knee brace is considered a member of the primary structural frame. So in this case, the, that knee brace would also need to be protected the same as the, well, it is the primary, it's part of the primary structural, so it would also need to be protected as required for primary. In this example, the, it's showing the concentric brace, and that would be considered secondary in this example, and would need to be protected as required for secondary, which is out to 12 inches out. And same with this one, eccentric brace. Just examples for you. Uh, and then secondary structural members, the, the, a little bit of a change, again, not the, the main portion of it hasn't changed, uh, but the, an item, well, the adding secondary structural members, they added that. And then in number three, bracing members that are not designated as part of a primary structural frame or bearing wall, making it a little bit more clear there. Uh, but again, structural members and components that are built into an assembly that supports a portion of a floor, roof, or only their own weight are considered to be secondary structural members. And then a visual for you again. You can see the secondary uh, structural frame up top. These. And, and then your primaries, primary structural there. Oops, excuse me, get the laser there. Smoke compartments, a change a bit of the definition for smoke compartment, a space within a building separated from other interior areas of the building by smoke barriers, including interior walls and horizontal assemblies. So you'll see we've got smoke barrier definition, smoke compartment definition, smoke compartment, they just cleaned it up a little bit. And but in, well, that's easy enough, it's no smoke compartments. It's the top, the bottom, the sides, it's a box, it's the whole thing. Terminated stops, something we've seen for years and years and years, but what do you call them? Now, or what do you call them and now they're in the code. So the, you can see the picture there, this is on the door frame. Uh, now there's a definition in here. So terminated stops are factory feature of a door frame where the stops of the door frame are terminated not more than six inches from the bottom of the door frame. Terminated stops are also known as hospital stops or sanitary stops. So we'll, there, the reason I have this in there is because there are some code sections that, that I say speak, but I guess read of this specifically. So we'll get into that later. 
when you're looking at definitions, uh, it, there's like, I don't know, model code I think has 700 definitions in California building code, we have 900 definitions. So lots of definitions, but words matter. Uh, even though chapter two isn't necessarily enforceable, it's incredibly important in using chapter two to figure out the code that you're looking at and, and, and what does this mean uh, when when there's a word that isn't defined that's in the code then it, it's general uh, definition is going to ap apply but we also use the uh, Merriam-Webster for the for a definition watch with the italics some people are confused with the italics because what's been historically the case has changed a little bit but you can see in this third uh, third bullet point here is ICC italicizes now as well. So not everything that you see in ital italics is California changes. It also includes, uh, IBC has included italics for when they have determined that that term's definition is especially key to or necessary for understanding a particular code. So they can get kind of confusing, but not like super, it's still the words, just pay attention to the words. Uh, but it, can cause a little bit of confusion. Let's move on to three. So chapters three through six, there's a little bit of cleanup with group Bs and I2 ones that the, if you were to look at today's code between the mid cycle 19, the regular 19, CBC and CFC, how the number of patients or, or patients that you're speaking of is listed is different in each one. So we've just made some changes to clean that up and make it more consistent. So again, this is chapter three in occupancy classifications under under group B, making it clear that ambulatory care facilities serving five or fewer patients, uh, and then says you go see 30833 for an I21, but if there are five or fewer, then that is a B. But just again, clearing up the the uh, making it more consistent between the, the different codes, the FC, CPC. So the threshold for classification as an I-2-1 is six or more. So if you have six or more, it crosses over to an I-2-1, five or less, which could be a, could be a B. And then an I, what is the I-2-1? It's a healthcare facility that receives persons for outpatient medical care that may render the patient incapable of unassisted self-preservation and where each tenant space accommodates more than five such pa patients. So again, just making the language consistent with the different sections, different definitions. So look, when I say words matter, look really closely at this one. A healthcare facility is different than an ambulatory healthcare facility. Again, look at the definitions and see what you have and which code sections apply for that. So if you got an ambulatory uh, healthcare facility, you're looking at 4, 422. So just watch with the language there because that's super close. Ambulatory healthcare facility versus just a regular healthcare facility. They're not one in the same. So an I-2-1 is not an ambulatory healthcare facility. Ambulatory healthcare facilities are limited to no more than five patients and capable of unassisted self-preservation and are classified as Bs. So summarizing that, five or less group B, six or more I-2-1. You hear all that blah, 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 and it comes down to that. Just kidding. Um, and there's so much more to that <laughs> with Bs and I-2-1s and how they're licensed, but that's not what we're here for today. A little bit of change for F1s. As you probably are aware, the energy storage systems are uh, becoming more popular. They aren't new, but they're becoming more popular. We at, at HKI, if you're familiar with Jamie Schnick, he's, a whole group has worked on, um, but Jamie's done a lot of the work for energy storage systems and microgrids. Code has a lot of language in there for these, including CFC. CFC has a lot of language uh, that's changed in the past couple editions. We'll get to that. So now they've included energy storage systems in the F1 group, as well as water and sewer treatment facilities. Those are now considered F1 groups for occupancy. We won't get into that right now. 
high rises this uh this section is not new it's just a little they just a little bit of cleanup here is the what when you need water supply in your high rises it in the language is just a little tweaked a little bit in all buildings having an occupied floor that that is more than 120 feet above lowest level fire department vehicle access that's the portion that changed they're just making it clear that all this section applies to all buildings that are more than 120 feet where before the way it was written was a little confusing the equipment room again just a little bit of change for cleanup if the standby or emergency power system includes a generator set inside a building, the system shall be located in separate room enclosure. Careful with the hourly ratings because for I, between I2s and the uh, gener and the F1, which a generator room is, is there's it's three hours, not two hours. So careful with that. It's just more stringent rules. Um, and then talking about the system supervision with the manual start and transfer features shall be provided at the fire command center. And then exception to this is for I2s, manual start and transfer features for the critical branch of the emergency power are not required to be provided at the fire command center if they're gonna have another 24 seven location. More language that's in the high rise section in 403 is about fuel line piping. The, the charging section has not changed, but their UL now has additional testing requirements for fuel lines. And so that's what's been added to this for the fuel lines that supply the generators that are inside the building. You have to talk about the separation uh, and, and the different manners of which the lines are to be protected. Again, this is just a portion of the section, not the whole thing. I'm only pointing out what's new. So what's new is number one, a fire resistant pipe protection system that has been tested in accordance with UL 1489. The system shall be installed as tested and in accordance with the manufacturer's installation instructions and shall have a rating of not less than two hours. Where the building is protected throughout with an automatic sprinkler system installed in accordance with 903311, the required rating shall be re reduced to one hour. So what this section is saying is yes, UL now has a uh, test method to evaluate the protection materials and systems for the fuel lines uh, or fuel pipe and that new that new method is UL 1489. Oops. Just a visual for you. Smoke control. Moving on in eight. Well, I should say atriums. So this, this, there's been some rearranging with 404 and atriums. So some of the language, like specifically for exiting, has been moved to Chapter 10. So when you look, if you have an atrium and you're looking at the requirements for it and say, hey, there's no more exiting, I can do whatever I want for exiting through the atrium. No, it's just moved. It's still, the requirements are still there. They're just moved to chapter 10, which of course is for egress. So please keep that in mind. This is one main reason I kept atriums in this presentation is not, we don't have a lot of facilities that have atriums, but we have some but just to please keep in mind that the exiting requirements regarding atriums is in chapter 10. And then of course, bringing in some of the language that we've gone over with the definitions, that it's, they cleared up some of the, the uh, 404 terminology and sections. So the provisions of 401 through 411 shall apply to buildings containing atriums. Atriums are not permitted in buildings or structures classified as H's. And then the exception to that, vertical openings that comply with 712-1112, excuse me, 1113-19 through 114. So that you'll see there that it's if you have a vertical opening, if it's an atrium, unless it's something else. And these other sections could be the, the something else. You got shafts, you got stairs, uh, that's all that's saying. And then when do you need smoke control? The in an I2, again, an atrium, if you have it, is two stories. So if you've got an atrium and an I2 and it it it's well, it's two stories, it's going to need smoke control. So as you've probably heard me mention in previous presentations, is make that something other than an I2. <laughs> yeah, I can't direct you. So I'm not directing you to do that, but something to consider is 
make that a different occupancy. It's separating it, you know, maybe it's a B and you've got a two hour fire barrier around it. But anyhow, if it's part of the I-2 and it's two stories, it needs smoke control. And then it's basically number one is saying, and then number two, a smoke control system is not required for atriums connecting more than two stories when all of the following are met, not one or the other, but all of them. Only the two lowest stories shall be permitted to be open to the atrium and all stories above the lowest two stories shall be separated from the atrium in accordance with the provisions of a shaft. So again, in, in I-2s, you need smoke control when it's two, two stories. And in other occupancies, you could also have it, uh, it permits the atrium to extend more than two stories without the smoke control only when the two lowest floors are open to the atrium and then all other levels are protected as a shaft. Corridors. This is just slight, slight, slight change. We just shifted the order of the words so that it made more sense. We're talking about door construction and indicating that corridor doors not required to have a fire protection rating shall comply with the, the following. It previously said doors in corridors. Well, you could have all kinds of doors and corridors that are for something else that aren't corridor doors, like your soil utility room, uh, a graded lobby door, something like that. Anyways. Uh, what they, what is added for ICC is language about Dutch doors. So just reading the whole section, corridor doors shall not have, shall not, corridor doors not required to have a fire protection rating shall comply with the following. Number one, solid doors shall have close fitting operational tolerances, head and jam stops. And then two, Dutch style doors shall have an astral rabbit or bevel at the meeting edges of the upper and lower door sections. Both the upper and lower door sections shall have latching hardware. Dutch style doors shall have a hard, hardware that connects the upper and lower sections to function as a single leaf. So yes, there's language in there now for Dutch doors. If they got them, there's a, a, several criteria that have to be met in order to have those doors. The swing of corridor doors, corridor doors other than those equipped with self-closing or auto-closing devices shall not swing into the required width of corridors. So in other words, if they swing in, uh, well, again, other than those equipped with self-closing or auto-closing doors, if they swing into the corridor width, they have to have self or auto-closing devices on them. And then there's an exception for that for in detention and or secure mental health facilities that the doors may swing into the required with the corridors as long as 44 inches clear is maintained with any one door open 90 degrees and clear corridor width required by chapter 12 can be maintained with the door open 180 degrees. Otherwise, if they're not in those facilities, uh, they swing into the corridor, they have to have the self-closing or auto-closing devices. Suites, just a, not really, again, a change, not a change in um, enforcement just clarifying the language a bit more so it's not not missed that what this section is talking about when you've got care suites containing sleeping rooms and that the sleeping rooms can be grouped into care suites where one of the following criteria is met. The first one, the arrangement of the care suite allows for direct and constant visual supervision into the sleeping rooms by care providers. And the second option in fully sprinkler buildings an automatic smoke detection system is provided in the sleeping rooms and installed in accordance with 9072622 item one and number, excuse me, NNFPA 72. So we had to put this language in here because of course code's written for new buildings, but we've got existing facilities that may not be sprinklered that would not be allowed to have the same uh, allowances as sprinklered buildings. So in this one, a care suite with sleeping rooms requires constant visual supervision or both sprinklers and smoke detection. Um, again, the IBC assumes the suite will be sprinkler because it's a new building, but we've again, we've got some existing facilities that don't have, are not fully sprinklered. So if they're not fully sprinklered, they obviously can't use number two. They only have one option. If they're not fully sprinklered, then they have to have the direct and constant supervision for everyone in the suite. So I say that, sorry, go back again. 
if they are fully sprinklered, then and they don't have the direct supervision, that can be okay, but they have to be fully sprinklered and smoke detection is going to be in every sleeping room, which as you are, I'm sure as you know, that's not typical for a suite. It is for regular sleeping rooms, but not for suites. So it's kind of the code giving a little bit of a little more leeway there, where it used to talk about a, a limitation of eight people in the suite. As you can see, that's gone away. And in its place, you've got you know the typical give and take of the code. Okay, you don't you're not limited to that number anymore. But when it's larger, when the suite's larger, because now you have more than eight people, you may not have the direct supervision because it's a larger uh, or more more people in there. So if you don't have that, okay, but your building's gotta be fully sprinklered and smoke detection in each sleeping space. For auto closing doors, activation of automatic closing doors on hold open devices, automatic closing doors on hold open devices in accordance with 716.266 shall also close upon activation of a fire alarm system, an automatic sprinkler system, or both. The automatic release of the hold open device on one door shall release all such doors within the same smoke compartment. So this is not necessarily new, especially, well, it's not necessarily new, it just gives you a little bit more of a uh, better definition or better understanding of the requirements there. But please remember that that is in addition to what's required in 716.266. So if the auto closing doors have the hold open devices, they also have to close upon activation of the fire alarm or the sprinkler system. Not You don't get to pick one, they got to be tied into both. And then if, so if either of those, the fire alarm goes off or the sprinklers go off, the door is automatically closed close. And then additionally, all the auto closing doors with the hold open devices in that same smoke compartment shall also close on fire alarm or sprinkler. Again, you're not picking between tying it to the fire alarm or tying it to the sprinkler. You got to tie them to both. And all the doors in the smoke compartment that are on hold opens have to close upon activation of fire alarm or sprinkler. Occupied roofs. But again, the Main idea is not new, but they added to the occupied roof section. What they've added, you can see at the very bottom of what's underlined, just making it clear that the occupied roof, if it qualifies to be an occupied roof, is not, it shall not be included in the building height or number of stories as regulated by 504, provided that the big word there, provided the penthouses and other enclosed roof structures comply with 1511. So again, if if you've got more than a th what 1511 is going to say, if you've got more than a third of that roof uh, with rooftop structures, it's going to be a story. So as long as this doesn't add to it, it doesn't have to count. But if it doesn't comply with 1511, it will count as a story. And then exceptions to that is the main exception number one and main portion of it has not changed but what has been added is that you've got emergency voice alarm communication system notification per 907522 shall also be provided in the area of the occupied roof where such system is required elsewhere in the building so if the rest of your building underneath this roof occupied roof requires emergency voice alarm communication system that that emergency voice alarm communication system has to be carried up through to the occupied roof level as well. 50632, we're now we're in, we're obviously in chapter five, and this is the section that is about air, allowable area frontage increase. So if you've done the, your allowable area increases in chapter five, you know that in, I don't remember if it was 19 or 16, I think it was 2016, the code changed so that when you were figuring out your calculations for I sub S, they made it a lot easier. Now they're working on making I sub F a little bit easier, which is key because I sub F is the one that's not a lot of fun if you don't love your math. Uh, so they're trying to make it a little bit easier. So 50632 minimum frontage distance to qualify for an area factor increase based on frontage, the public way or open space adjacent to the building perimeter 
shall have a minimum distance W, that's represented as W when you're doing your calcs, of 20 feet measured at right angles from the building face to any of the following. Number one, you measure it to the closest interior lot line, or two, the entire width of the street, alley, or public way, or three, the exterior face of an adjacent building on the same property. So again, this is when you're doing your very beginning of your plan and can I increase the size of my building? What do the tables say I can have? What's the area frontage that I have around the building? Do I have any? How much do I have? Can I use this to increase the size of my building? That's what this is talking about. So when you're looking at that, the frontage increase shall be based on the smallest public way or open space that is 20 feet or greater. Less than 20 feet, you don't even get to count it. So, uh, and the percentage of the building perimeter having a minimum 20 feet public way or open space. So you need the right percentage. You got to have 25% of the building perimeter that opens on uh, frontage that is more than 20 feet in order to even start considering if you can have a uh, area increase due to frontage. So what's helpful now is now there's a table. So when you're figuring out that increase, you're you're looking at the table. You still got to do the math of looking at the perimeter of your building, how much uh, frontage is available. Does any of the frontage have more than 20 feet and is more than 25% of the frontage available? But then you go to this table and you plug this number into your calc. Makes it a lot easier. So here's a visual for you, for you. You've got a building that has the so you, here's here's your different you're measuring out to your different uh whether it's your public well, the, the street the lot line the public way you're measuring out to where you can you can see that on um, for this length of the building when you're looking at the perimeter this length of it is only has 15 feet it's not more than 20 you don't get to count it here has 40. this obviously has more than 40 uh and then 26 here so you, you've got more than 25% of your building perimeter that has frontage that can be used. It's more than 20 feet. So you go back to your, you go to your table. What's the, uh, let me get the laser again, percentage of the building perimeter. You got 50 to less than 75% of the perimeter that has frontage more than 20 feet that can be used. And then what dimensions did you have? We go back. 40 feet, 26 feet, etc. So you've got 25 to less than 30 is what you're going to have to use for part of that. You can use 0 0.42. 0 0.42 is what you're going to plug into your calcs for your I sub F value factor. So without going through all of chapter five, again, this is why I say, please go read, <laughs> go read the, area, the sections surrounding this portion that we're talking about, because there's a lot to it. But the whole process is a matter of, one, you're determining the percentage of the perimeter considered to be open. Two, identifying the smallest open space or public way that's at least 20 feet in width, and then apply the applicable row and column in the table to identify the I sub F factor, and then do your math from there. Portica shares. We've got language. If you're familiar, we have a can for Portica shares right now, your ambulance drop off, your ambulance drop off. Uh, we will still have to have that can, but as we try to do with our cans, our code application notices is eventually codify, codify them. Some can be, some can't be, some you have cans forever. <laughs> our Portica share can, we've put in the code what we can. No pun intended. Um, and then we will still need the can for certain scenarios, but for the most part, what you need is now in the code for your Portica shares. So in Chapter Five, you five zero eight is your uh, section for your separate separation of occupancies, and you're either going to have an accessory occupancy that doesn't have to be separated, or a separated occupancy because uh, code requires all other occupancies adjacent to the I-2 to be separated, so you don't get to use the non-separated portion. So you're either going to have accessory or separated. Uh, in 50824 is the section that's about accessory occupancies and indicates that no separations required between accessory occupancies and the main occupancy. That part hasn't changed. 
that's the charging section. And then, and then it will say that group I2 and 2-1 shall be separated from all other occupancies in accordance with 5084. That's where you get your either separated or accessory. And then exception to the accessory is no separation is required between B, E, and R2 sleeping units accessory to I2 and 2-1 and covered exterior entrances required by 11B206410 or 1224-3321 that are accessory to the group I2. I keep saying accessory in that funny way because it, in order to not be, in order for your Porta Cachera to not be separated from the I2, it's gotta be accessory to. To qualify as accessory to that space, the, the uh, R2, the B or the E, or the Porta Cachera has to be less than 10% of the, um, other similar areas on the floor and accessory to it's got to be an it's got to be related to the main use uh portica shares are considered s2s so you'll see in previous code editions that it says you don't need a separation between the s2 uh, that was meant for rooms like janitor's closets the storage rooms that aren't otherwise required to be separated but because Vortica shares are considered as twos, it carried over to that. So we cleaned it up saying, no, you got different requirements for your Portica shares. And then I, for I3s, they also have uh, similar allowances for accessory. So in those sections that are referenced, 1224 and 11B, those sections are indicating that you need covered entrances for weather protection at the entrance. 11B is the one that says you need a, co a covered entrance for weather protection. And then 1224 is the section that says you need the covered entrance for the ambulance drop off. So only when you have those two for your portica shares is that applicable or is this section applicable. So just for the two required spaces, again, the drop off for what the cover drop off for weather protection and ambulance. When you got portica shares for either of those two reasons that the code requires you to have, you can look at them as accessory to the I2. It will those will have to be sprinklered. They're part, they're considered part of the building, accessory to the I2. It's part of the building. So those will have to be sprinklered and same construction type as the building. And then to match this, we have a footnote in 5084 to make it clear that if they're not considered accessory, so they do not fall within the parameters to be called accessory and they have to be separated, the, the, um, your table would say that you would need a two hour separation between an I2 and an S2. So don't forget the footnotes. The footnote gives a little bit of a giveaway here. So when those are not considered accessory and they have to be separated, then the required separation between the I-2 for just these two things, accessible entrance covers and emergency vehicle entrances uh, that are sprinklered, they can read, if they're sprinklered and they're not accessory, they can, their separation can be one hour instead of two. I'm not going to, we'll skip through this one there, skip through a few there. Uh, in chapter six, 603 is the section that uh, has the list of materials and items that are combustible that are permitted in a non-combustible type one or two building. Right off the bat, one of the, fir the first thing on the list is, okay, you can have fire retardant treated wood, but only in these areas. You can have them in non-bearing partitions where the required fire resistance rating is two hours or less. So if You've got a non-bearing partition that's one hour. The code saying you could have fire retardant treated wood within that. Sometimes you'll see that for mounting of um, like your TV monitor or something like that. You'll have some plywood behind it to, to bulk that up. But anyways, you can, it's, so it's saying that you can have that plot, not fire retardant treated wood in that non-bearing partition where it's less, two hours or less, except in shaft enclosures within I2 occupancies and ambulatory care facilities. So if you cannot have the, if I return treated wood, if it's a shaft. Uh, and then still on number one in 603 is where fire return treated wood is permitted. Number two, new or 
changed a bit. For group I2, roof construction containing fire retardant treated wood shall be covered by not less than a class A roof covering or roof assembly. And the roof assembly shall have a fire resistance rating where required by the construction type. So this is this is saying if you've got the fire retardant treated wood in an I2 on the roof, then that roof has to have a class A roof covering. And actually the language, I would probably clean that up a bit because a roof assembly is a thing. So you're going to have the assembly that's required per 601. So again, there are areas that you can have fire retardant treated wood, but it's very specific. So please go to 603.1 to look at that and determine where and when you can use that. Some of those changes were made to uh, be consistent with NFPA 101. Still in the same section, 6031, where you're allowed to have combustibles, is new number 27, wood nailers for parapet flashing and roof cants. So yes, the wood nailers are allowed, either, even though they're combustible, they're allowed to be uh, used in type one and two construction. Moving on through to chapter seven through nine, You've got secondary attachments to structural members. This was new to you last year, if you were here, or not last year, last code edition. Uh, so this section is not new, but it needed a little bit of cleaning up. So SFM changed this a little bit. This section saying that where you've got the secondary uh, structural members attached to the primary, that those have to be protected to 12 inches out. What they're making clear here is that, again, where primary and secondary structural steel members require fire protection, any additional structural steel members having direct connection to the primary structural frame or secondary structural members shall be protected. They're making that clear because, yes, we did have people come and say, well, you've got to spray the hangers for the for the sprinklers because they're attached to the structural members. That was not what this section meant. <laughs> the section is talking about primary structural members and then the secondary structural members attached to them also needing protection. And then how's that done? It's protected to 12 inches out. It is not meant for things like your hangers on your <laughs> sprinkler for your sprinklers. Now, that being said, of course, if those are up there, that protection on that primary and secondary have to be maintained but anyway so that was just clearing that up to make it make it clear that they're talking about primary and structural or excuse me primary and secondary structural members and then language in there for the howl attachments is not new but just put that there as a reminder the table for when you've got a projection and how a projection off of your building and how far can it extend what does it have to be made out of etc that table has been modified a little bit uh, if you've done the math, if you've had to look at this and you look at when you had a fire separation distance between three, three to less than five feet, the minimum distance from the line used to determine the fire separation distance, that was a little bit messed up mathematically. So now they've changed it again. So yes, you can have protect, projections off of the building, but how far they can extend is, is regulated and then uh, well, we'll get to the one they're less than five feet. So um, I guess we can read through this. So the permitted extent of projections is established by 7052 and based solely on the clear distance between the building's exterior wall and an interior lot line, center line of a public way or assumed imaginary line between the two buildings. So this is measured differently than your chapter five stuff for your fire separation distance. What is the fire separation distance? It explains it here. That's in definitions. Again, telling you that projections are allowed to extend beyond the exterior wall, but only for limited distance. And then the required clearance is based on the fire separation distance measured from the exterior wall. Here's an example. You've got your fire separation distance shown. What is that separation distance? And then you've got your projection. How far can that projection extend to uh, how can within the fire separation distance line, I assume property line, lot line, whatever you're measuring to. Different view for you. These are just examples of the different types of projections you might have. 
it's off it seems that the um roof overhang is often forgotten it's pretty clear when you got a projection like a balcony or like this outdoor lounge but don't forget about the roof overhangs those are considered projections and there are limitations to how far or how close that can be to the lot line and then if you've got projections that are within five feet of the lot line then those have to be protected by one of these ways so yes you can have the projection and yes you may have projections within 40 inches of the fire separation distance but if that projection is within five feet of the fire separation distance then that projection has to be protected and then how it's protected is one of these ways uh, either non-combustible it's going to be made of non-combustible materials or it's combustible materials of not less than one hour fire resistance rate of construction or it's heavy timber construction that complies with 230411 or fire retardant treated wood or as otherwise permitted by 705231. An exception to this, of course, is for 5Bs, but those are for our threes and use, so we're not going to focus on that. Um, let me see here. This isn't new. This is just leading you up to the next couple of slides. So when you have the 705 is your section for exterior walls. And this section is saying that when you're in occupancies other than AEHIL and R's, high rises and other SFM occupancies, that the wall would only have to be tested from exposure from one side. But in an for our occupancies, you've got to, those walls have to be tested from exposure, fire exposure on both sides. And that's just kind of a preamble into this part of that chapter. This is kind of a big move, not a big change, but a big move is a move of a table. So again, we're in 705 talking about exterior walls. The table that used to be in six, that used to be 601, excuse me, uh, 602 has moved. So when you're looking in six zero in chapter six and you you know that, hey, I gotta look, I always gotta look at table 601 and 602. When you turn that page and 602 disappeared, does it mean you don't have anything to comply with? No, it just moved to chapter seven, it's still here. So 602 is now in 705.5, the table. So it's not, again, it's not new information, they just moved it. So still look at two tables. You're still going to be looking at both tables. It's just now you got to go to chapter seven for the second portion. Uh, language that's changed for exterior walls for, or excuse me, for fire barriers. So we, I'm sorry, we moved to 707, which is section for fire barriers. And when you've got a room that's required to be a fire barrier, does the, and it also has a wall on the exterior, does that exterior wall have to be rated? Maybe, maybe not. The charging section says it doesn't have to be rated unless basically it otherwise has to be rated. <laughs> so what their stairways are gonna, if you've got a stairway that obviously has a fire barrier around it, if part of that stairway is an exterior wall, that exterior wall doesn't have to be rated unless uh, chapter t the specific requirements chapter 10 say it has to, that's not new, but Similarly, what's been added to this is the exterior walls for the energy storage systems. If you've got a room that is for energy storage systems that's going and that is required to be rated, it's going to be rated with the fire barrier. And they have to rate the exterior wall. So if you've got a room for energy storage systems uh, and it has the amount of uh, battery or that has the capacity that exceeds what's allowed and needs to be rated, then that rating goes all the way around, including the exterior wall. Just a visual. And the openings, don't forget about the openings. There, uh, we'll get into this in a little bit too, but the openings you can see on the um, side here, again, we're just talking about a room that's an energy storage system room that's required to be rated. The rating goes all the way around. And then if there's an opening of a glazed opening, 
you will know, we'll have language that shows that fire protection rated glazing is not permitted in enclosures for energy systems. Fire resistance rated glazing is permitted. What's the difference? How they're tested. Fire resistance rated glazing is going to be the glazing that's tested as a wall per ASTME 119 UL 263. Fire protection rated glazing is just what you're normally going to see for your, your window opening. So, well, that's not tested on a wall. So that's the huge difference. So yes, the rating has to go all the way around. If there's if there are glazed openings, then they have to be tested as a wall. If they're not, they're not allowed. This is basically saying what I just said about the windows. Again, if you got an energy storage room, then that book and have glazing that on the on the walls, that glazing has to be tested as a wall. Or ASTME 119 UL 263. It's fire resistance rated glazing is what you have to use, not fire protection rated glazing. Still in 707 for fire barriers. Of uh, the charge, the main charging section for the continuity of fire barriers, how they extend, hasn't changed. So it's saying that your fire barriers have to extend from the top of the foundation or floor ceiling assembly below to the underside of the floor or roof sheeting slab or deck above. So you straight up and down. Your fire barriers, when you've got fire barriers, have to go all the way from uh, floor assembly to ceiling roof assembly, all the way through. But now there's a new exception that for some of you that were familiar with this in two, pre-2007 edition, so 2000 and earlier, it kind of brings this back into play. So for exit passageways only, so when you have a fire barrier, you have an exit passageway, it's required to be protected with a fire barrier. That exit passageway enclosure required by 1024.3 that does not extend to the underside of the roof sheeting slab or deck above shall be enclosed at the top with construction of the same fire resistance rating as required for the exit passageway. So what's that saying? Going back to what it used to allow, if, and it, but remember it's only for exit passageways, not all fire barriers. All other fire barriers are gonna have to go all the way through up here to the floor or roof assembly above. If you have an exit passageway, it is now allowed again to, to terminate here as long as the construction is the same uh, resistance, fire resistance rating on the exit passageway. So that'll make some people happy, especially if you're doing a remodel. Fire partitions, your typically your corridor walls, the charging section has not changed, but they've added to the list of where you might see a fire partition. Uh, if you'll see them, you could see them in the ambulatory care facilities, separating from adjacent spaces uh, or tenant spaces. You'll see them between dwelling and sleeping units in R1s and 2s and in vestibules in accordance with 1028.2. Again, these are not new. They just added to the list. Like they kind of forgot to put them in before. 709, talking about smoke barriers. Smoke barrier assemblies separating smoke compartments. So assemblies against the whole thing, right? The, not just one part of a wall, it's the whole thing. Smoke barrier assemblies used to separate smoke compartments shall form an effective membrane enclosure that is continuous from an outside wall or smoke barrier wall to an outside wall or another smoke barrier wall and to horizontal assemblies. So again, it's a box. You have the top, the bottom, the sides, the whole thing is rated, you got smoke barriers that are technically walls, but you got a smoke compartment that the smoke barrier makes. Uh, so again, it's not new, just making it a little bit clear that yes, it includes the top and the bottom as well. Remember that when you've got penetrations and you wouldn't maybe don't remember the L rating. Uh, remember if you got penetrations going through the floor ceiling assembly or the roofs, well, the ceiling portion of the roof ceiling assembly, those also need to be protected with and with an L rating because that's part of the smoke compartment. We've moved to 713 for shaft enclosures. The top of shaft enclosure shall comply with one of the following. So the charging, it, well, I'll just read it. You always have language in the code for how you're gonna terminate the top of your shaft, but it's just cleaned up a little bit. So how, when you have a shaft, 
how do you close it up at the top? Well, if it's a fire barrier, because shafts have to have fire barriers, then that charging section said, it taking it through to the roof ceiling assembly above, all the way through. Okay, well, if you don't have that, here are some other options. You can extend to the underside of the roof sheeting deck or slab of the building and the roof assembly shall comply with the requirements for the type of construction in 601. So that's obviously always an option. You take it all the way through to the roof ceiling assembly, the underside of it. Or uh, you terminate below the roof assembly. So you're not taking it through to the roof sheeting, but you can terminate it below the assembly. And if that happens, it has to be enclosed at the top with construction of the same fire resistance rating as the topmost floor penetrated by the shaft. So you got a two hour floor, the top of that's going to be constructed as two hour. And then, but not less than the fire resistance rating required for the shaft enclosure. Or three, it could extend past the roof assembly and comply with the requirements of 1511. Again, we've said that enough times that you know 1511 is the one um, about the story and the one third. So here's your three individual. It's either fire barrier going all the way through, like the charging section indicates. If it doesn't go all the way through to the roof or floor assembly, it can terminate below it as long as the rating is the same as what the shaft is required and the last floor that, you know, and the floor that it's gone through. Or the third one, it can extend above the roof assembly, but has to comply with section 1511. And then penthouse mechanical rooms, a fire smoke damper shall not be required at the penetration of the rooftop structure where the shaft enclosures extend up through the roof assembly into a rooftop structure conforming with 1511. Ductwork in the shaft shall be connected directly to the HVAC equipment. So for the explanatory here, it recognizes that not every penetration or opening that pierces a roof requires protection. Some do, some don't. This one's saying this doesn't. CBC typically doesn't, does not address conditions where fire spreads from interior of the building to the exterior. Examples include unprotected roof openings for penetrations in 714, ducts in 717, and skylights. So this, this is the same where a mechanical penthouse provides an extension of a shaft enclosure from below, neither a fire or smoke dampers required at that penetration, as long as all the ductwork in that shaft enclosure is directly connected to the HVAC equipment. Move down to 715 sections, you got, we're gonna be talking about joints and voids. The provisions, the general portion, 715, the provisions of the section shall govern the materials and methods of construction used to protect joints and voids in or between horizontal and vertical assemblies. And what it's going to say is that, yes, they both have to be filled, whether you have a joint or a void, uh, but they have to be uh, Joints have to be filled, but joints at fire resistance rated floor and wall intersections also have to be protected by listed systems. Again, not new, but they're addressing voids a little more clearly now. Joints, we know you've got to have a listed approved assembly at your joints, your header wall, your curtain wall, etc. But also at voids, voids have to be filled, so protected versus filled. And voids you find more, well, let me read through this first because it's going to depend on your scenario. Uh, systems or materials protecting joints and voids shall be securely installed in accordance with the manufacturer's installation instructions in or on the joint or void for its entire length so as not to dislodge, loosen, or otherwise impair its ability to accommodate expected building movements and to resist the passage of fire and hot gases. Fire resistant joint systems or systems used to protect voids at exterior curtain walls and fire resistance rated floor intersections shall also be installed in accordance with the listing criteria, making that clear that all the spaces in between the fire resistant rated assembly and whatever it's hitting the head of wall, curtain wall, et cetera, have to be protected the whole length of it. So this example is just showing you a curtain wall and the voids protected for 715.4 if the floor is rated and it's 
filled if the floor is not rated. So most of ours, you're gonna have rated floors, it's gonna be protected as normal. And then for your exterior curtain wall, fire resistance rated floor intersections, again, the voids, uh, it's really just kind of saying the same thing over again, but just different section. And then what is that criteria that has to that has to be met? So these joints and voids that have to be protected, uh, what do they have to be protected to? The perimeter fire containment system shall be tested in accordance with the requirements of ASTM E2307, except for the voids. Voids created at the intersection of exterior curtain wall assemblies and floor assemblies where the vision glass extends to the finished floor level shall be permitted to be protected with an approved material to prevent the interior spread of fire. Such material shall be securely installed and capable of preventing the passage of flame and hot gases sufficient to ignite cotton waste or subjected to ASTME 119 time temperature fire conditions under a minimum positive pressure differential of 0 0.01 inch of water column for the time period not less than the fire resistance rating of the floor assembly. So either way, you've got where protection is required. If it's required to be protected, in other words, you got it at a fire resistance rated assembly, it's required to be protected. It's got to pass one test or another. This is still on the voids part of it in 715. Again, the void only has to be filled, not protected. But again, we, we shouldn't run into this too much because this is more common at an occurrence where you don't have a fire rated, uh, you don't have a fire rated wall, fire rated assembly. And then making it a little more clear for spandrels, curtain wall spandrels is the height and fire resistance requirements for curtain wall spandrels shall comply with 70585, where 70585 does not require fire resistance rated curtain wall spandrels, then the requirements of 715, four and five shall still apply to the intersection between the curtain wall spandrels and the floor. You keep seeing spandrels, but what are spandrels? So what is it? In multi-story buildings, the it's the section between the floors where the building components are held, that's called the spandrel. And when the building has a full glass facade with a seamless appearance, the glass covering the spandrel area is referred to as spandrel glass. And then the spandrel panel can be steel, glass, ceramic, or aluminum. So the section we just read is saying, yep, the spaces in between there also have to be protected. You don't want smoke going up and down, or probably not down, but you don't want it going up through the building. And then when you have these joints and voids and smoke barriers, please don't forget those are smoke barriers. Your floors are part of that smoke compartment. They will also need that L rating. So when you're looking at what listing do you have, for filling, for protecting your joints and your voids, remember the L rating. There's that terminated stops you're talking about on the, for the doors. And so they, this indicating where terminated stops are prohibited. So when you're in 716, we're in the opening section of the code and we're talking about doors. And in this particular section, we're talking about doors that have to be smoking draft control and that's saying that you've got doors that are required to be smoke and draft control then the and you terminated stops the terminated stop shall be prohibited on doors that are required by 4053 um, and prohibit on doors required by item 3 in chapter 30 with your elevators and 3007 3008 so this section is telling you where you cannot well when you, it's not it's telling you way more than that. <laughs> Talking about the air leakage that you have to have, um, uh, or excuse me, the, oh, the requirements for the ambient temperature, temperature test, that louvers prohibited, all of that hasn't changed. That's what you have to have when you have smoke and draft control doors. But if you, you're required to have those doors, you cannot have the terminated stops on those doors in these locations. To summarize that, so you don't have to look up those sections. Those sections are saying you cannot have those when in your elevator that's serving multiple smoke compartments in an underground building. You can't have those uh, terminated stops on additional doors providing smoke and draft control for elevator hoistway openings. You cannot have them on lobby doors serving fire 
service access elevator and you cannot have them on lobby doors serving occupant evacuation elevators. So again, that section is just saying you cannot have those on smoke and where those doors are required to be smoke and draft control. If in those locations, you cannot have the terminated stop. Uh, still in 716 for openings. This is talk, this is these are footnotes that are in the table 716.12 uh, for doors and double doors and fire walls and fire partitions. So when you go to table 716, it's going to say, all right, you got this type of wall and your door is required to be this rated with the glazing rated like this, this and the transom like this, blah, blah, blah. So at the bottom of that table, you got your footnotes. Two doors, each with a fire protection rating of an hour and a half, installed on opposite sides of the same opening in a fire wall, shall be deemed equivalent in fire protection rating to one three-hour fire door. So footnote D is specifically for fire walls. Why would you need two doors like that? Think about your fire walls that are allowed to comply with NFPA 221, which are double fire barriers essentially that make one that make a fire that are equivalent to a firewall you may have that condition uh, between your buildings where you're using the double firewalls fire barriers to create a firewall you would have two openings because you have two even though they're right next to each other you've got two walls and you've got an opening in both if you just put one door in there you'd only have an hour and a half you wouldn't have the three hour that would otherwise be required so this is saying you can go ahead, put two doors in if they're both an hour and a half. Similarly, for, for fire partitions and footnote I is saying you could have two doors, but those will have each with a rating of 20 minutes. They can be used and be considered equivalent to 45 minutes. Look like this, probably not gonna see that too often, but hey, you can do it, it, it table and footnotes allow you. Dampers make uh, switching to 717 for dampers. There are requirements for access panels. That's not new, but what has been clarified more is what size are those. So at the very bottom of this, you have the requirement for right here. We've got the you're required to have the access panel. What how big are those? They have to have an access door that's not less than 12 inches square or provided with a removable duct section. Of course, the access shall not affect the integrity of the fire resistance rated assemblies. It shall not reduce the fire resistance rating assembly and they have to be tight fitting and suitable for the required duct construction. And then there's restrict, restricted access where space constraints or physical barriers restrict access to a damper for a periodic inspection and testing. The damper shall be a single or multi-blade type damper and shall comply with the remote inspection requirements of NFPA 80 or NFPA 105. So again, the main part that's changed there or at least been clarified a bit is that that access panel has to be at least 12 inches square for the damper access. Let me skip through these and then jump into automatic sprinkler systems, chapter nine. Careful with this, your charging section says you can use alternative fire extinguishing systems, but not for I2s for health, hospitals, nursing, and convalescent homes. Statute requires sprinklers. You can have those in addition to the sprinklers, but you cannot have the alternative extinguishing systems instead of sprinklers. You gotta have sprinklers in our facilities. There's new language, a lot of new language in this in these sections about sprinklers and parking garages. Uh, I, you know, we see those sometimes, but not enough where I thought it was beneficial for this presentation. If you do have parking garages with your facility, please look at the requirements for sprinklers in those parking garages. There are a lot, there's a lot more information there for those. And then again, to match the changes what I was talking about from our the Portica shares for the ambulances and the uh, patient drop-off, the weather protected patient drop-off, the requirement for those to be sprinklered. It's in here now. And 
this section isn't changed, it's just kind of the preamble for what's coming next is that this is the section that is in 903 where you need sprinklers, and then 9033111, exempt locations where you don't have to have sprinklers, and as always, elevators are part of this topic. What is new or, uh, yeah, this is new. Sorry, I also write the mid-cycle 22, and we're on that right now, so I'm kind of going backwards for the 22 changes. But anyways, this is new to 22, is saying that the sprinklers can re be removed from elevator hoistways, machine rooms, machinery spaces, control spaces, and control rooms when in accordance with 300541 of the building code. So you've seen the, those sections before in Chapter 30, to remove the sprinklers with certain criteria in place. That section's changed again. This section in nine is just matching that up. That's saying, yep, yeah, if if it's in compliance, the design's in compliance with 300541, the sprinklers can be removed. We'll get into that later. We They can be removed from solar photovoltaic power systems in these specific areas. If there's no, if you've got the panel, and the structure and there's no use underneath, then signs may be provided as determined by the enforcing agency prohibiting any underneath use and underneath including storage. If they have that, they don't have to have the sprinklers. And then for sol solar photovoltaic panels that are supported by framing that have sufficiently uniform, sufficient uniformly distributed and unobstructed openings throughout the top of the array, which is the horizontal plane, that allows heat and gases to escape as determined by the enforcing agency. So again, the enforcing agency has to look at it, but the sprinklers could be removed from these areas for solar photovoltaics. Portable extinguishers, watch with this section um, because Title 19 has very specific lang language or requirements, excuse me, for, for portable fire extinguishers. So make sure to look at your, adopt the, the, not yours, but the adoption, the matrix for chapter nine to see if SFM adopts the specific section you're looking at. So some of them are applicable, but there's much more information and much more requ requirements in NF, or excuse me, in Title 19. But this is the section that's saying where Portable extinguishers are required, but it's not just here. There's a lot more in locations required in Title 19. Moving on to fire alarm, pre-signal features. Pre-signal features are not allowed in an I-2 or 2-1 occupancy or the R-2-1s. So I want to point that out because, yes, the, the section is in here, but please pay attention to the exception. We do not allow pre-signal features for fire alarm. And what are those? The, the alarm first only sounds in uh, de department offices or a control room or a, some other constantly attended location. It only sounds there first. And then where, where there's a connection to the remote location, the transmission of the fire alarm to the supervising station activates upon the initial alarm signal, and then action is taken. So either the human being activates the general alarm or a feature that allows a delay by not, uh, by more than one minute after the start alarm processing. So again, excuse me, these come up a lot. We do not allow pre-signal fire alarm in I2. That's the big takeaway there. Here, audibles, the charging section hasn't changed for audible devices, audible alarm notification appliances. Uh, yes, they've got to be provided and, per, and emit a distinctive sound, but the reason I have this in here, so even though this hasn't changed, this charging section hasn't changed, there's a bit of language that's changed or added for R1s and R2 sleeping rooms. Why am I talking about that? When we're talking about hospitals is you may have a design in your facility that has doctor sleeping quarters or staff sleeping quarters that are cons are considered an R. And if they have those, they're going to be required to have these audibles. They always have been. It's not, this isn't new. <laughs> they've all, they've, but it's been in 72. They're just making it clearer here that if you've got those sleeping rooms, 
they've got to provide, be provided with the audibles and have uh, 520 hertz low frequency signal complying with 72. It's also going to say it needs to make have the temp three um, pattern, but you can't have that in the hospital because we have chimes and you can't mix the sounds. So there's allowance, and I'll read that in a second. Uh, so again, where, where you have a requirement for a fire alarm system and you've got these sleeping areas, they have to have they have to meet these requirements. Again, that's going to be more that's going to be for the spaces like the doctors or staff's sleeping quarters. This is not talking about this is not for the patient areas. We've got some more specific requirements for patient areas. I only bring this up because of the staff sleeping areas. And this, that yes, if you have those staff sleeping areas that are considered in our use, and it, in, in, in our cases, those are usually accessory, they will need that audible alarm. And the, this charging section says they need the three pulse temp pattern. Ex, and then the exception, the use of existing evacuation signaling scheme shall be permitted where approved by the enforcing agency. So this is what we will use if you do have those sleep doctor staff sleeping areas and you have these audibles they're not temp three they're going they're the same as sound as the rest of the facility because you can't mix the sound of the fire alarm it causes confusion and we require the chimes um, this section is not necessarily new this is talking about your your visibles the charging section is the same. Um, oops, let me go back one. Make sure. Yeah, this part is not new, but there are modifications to the, this part, the critical care. So visual alarm notification appliances are not required in critical care areas of I2s, as long as those critical areas are in compliance with 907525. And that, and as well in a visible alarm notification appliance installed at a nurse's control station or other continuously attended staff location in a group I2 care suite, just the suite shall be acceptable, an acceptable alternative to the installation of visible alarm notification appliances throughout the suite in I2s, as long as that whole suite is in compliance with 907525. So those pretty clear there. I'll we'll move to 10, chapter 10. Um, table 10.0621 is the table for when you can have one exit or exit access doorway. We don't usually see this, but we still had to clean up the table so that it, it was accurate. So the take again, building code is usually is for build, not usually, is building for new, but when you've got existing facilities that don't have sprinklers, like we sometimes do for our pre-March 472 1As, uh, we have to consider those in the building code because of remodels. So we just added the footnote here, footnote I, that in, in accordance with health and safety code section 13113D, there's no requirement for automatic sprinkler protection in the the existing, the March, the pre-March 472 I2s that are in 1As. We had to put that in here because otherwise there, there's, they wouldn't come, you wouldn't be able to have them, you wouldn't have any compliance there. So those facilities, this language is kind of saying the same thing, and then the facilities are considered to be in compliance with the code that was required at that time, and our allowances in, in 407 for those buildings and refers you to the sections that are applicable for existing structures. Still in means of egress, 10.06.222 for refrigeration machinery rooms. The, for SFM, we, we deleted an, a model code provision that allowed for an increase in the exit access travel distance in refrigeration machinery rooms. Um, and then ICC added provisions that that door, this third point here, exit and exit access doorway shall swing in the direction of egress travel and shall be equipped with panic hardware, regardless of the occupant mode served. Exit and exit, exit access doorway shall be tight fitting and self-closing. So there's addition, 
additional or more clear criteria for the doors for the refrigeration machinery rooms. But please make sure if you're looking at model code, remember we don't adopt everything they do. Uh, and one of those was increasing the travel distance in the refrigeration machinery, and we did not adopt that. So we still have when the room, when the refrigeration machinery rooms are larger than a thousand square feet, they have to have two exits or exit access doorways and their distance shall be separated by horizontal distance equal to one half the maximum horizontal of all dimension of the room. And then all portions of the machinery room shall be within 150 feet of an exit or exit access doorway. Just putting that out there because again that differs from what model code has. This is these are our provisions. For electrical rooms, the, the location and number of exit or exit access doorways shall be provided for electrical rooms in accordance with these specific sections. It says on FPA 70, um, our CEC, of course, is going to have that same language. The reason we this was changed is, yes, you need the, the well, there was, it was changed with how many exits do you need from your electrical room, um, but it's not so we can't just say electrical room anymore. What's in it? What's the size of the equipment in it? And in CEC and NFPA 70, there are specific requirements for the types of electrical room that you're in. The sizes, again, what's the equipment in there? And there are specific requirements for the doors that they have to have in those spaces. So we're matching, we're matching that with this. So previously it was just an electrical room with of a certain size with equipment greater, you know, with a width greater than, I forget what it was, three or six feet, needed these ex exits. Now it's saying, no, you gotta go look in these, in NFPA 70 and see what kind of room it is and what's in the room for more specifics. From illumination for means of egress, uh, this is a model code change. The Illumination level under normal power. The means of egress illumination level shall not shall be not less than one foot can, candle at the walking surface. That hasn't changed. But along exit access stairways, exit stairways, and at their required landings, the illumination level shall not be less than 10 foot candles at the walking surface when the stairway is in use. So that's a difference there that some could miss because it's Part of this charging section, the beginning hasn't changed. You still got your one foot candle at other areas, but when you're at the stairways, uh, exit access stairways, the exit stairways and their landings, then that illumination has to be not less than 10 foot candles. But at the very end, it says when the stairway is in use. So it's not at all times, uh, or excuse me, under normal power that is, I'm sorry. Um, but please, Please keep that in mind so that that foot candle rating is different for these stair areas. It's 10, not one. And then exit illumination uh, has to be on emergency power all the way through, including that space we just talked about. When you have so all the way, when well, I say all the way through, sorry, I should finish my sentence. So you got the three components of your means of egress. You got your exit, your exit access, and through an exit discharge, and that includes through to the public way. So your emergency lighting is required all the way through to the public way, and it has to be on emergency power all the way through to the public way. So watch these areas that you sometimes see these the high intensity light lamps that that I, I call it ramp up or they ramp up slowly uh, they to get to their full lumen uh, that has to happen within 10 seconds. So watch the types of lighting that you're using for these in the side of the building is not usually a problem and even at the exit discharge look right there at the door isn't necessarily a problem but this has to be through the public way. So please watch in determining the type of lighting you're choosing. That's got to be at the code minimum within the 10 seconds. Size of doors. This section has not, uh, the enforcement has not changed. We just changed the language to make it clearer that when you're required to have a 44 inch door and you've got the two leaves, so we'll look at the very bottom here. 
so the, the charging section it, or this the whole thing is the charging section but it used to just uh, be specific about you know yes you need the size the 32 inch and you need the 44 inch when you have uh, movement of beds and stretcher patients that was clear but what was left kind of open-ended was it only addressed when you had the 32 inch door where that sec where this section requires a minimum clear opening with the 32 inches and a door opening includes two door leaves without a mullion. One leaf shall provide a minimum clear opening of 32 inches. And then it kind of uh, didn't talk about the 44. So we added the language in for 44 that yes, when in an I2 or 2-1, when you've got a door that's the means of egress, of course, for movement of bed stretcher patient, of course, has to be 44 inches. And where this section requires that clear with the 44 inches and the door opening includes two door leaves without a mullion, that one leaf has to provide the 44 inches. It's not new in practice or enforcement. It's just here, now it's here, written down, made it clear that yes, when you've got the two leaves, that one has to provide the 44 clear. You don't get the 44 clear with both of them pushed open together. One leaf has to provide the four, 44 and measured as, as normal. There's an exception for sizes of doors for the single use shower or sauna toilets, stalls, or dressing, or fitting, or changing rooms, those doors can uh, are permitted to have a an opening of 20 inches. But remember, if it's for bed and stretcher, you don't get that. Projections into the clear openings for this, this section, again, the charging section hasn't changed, but there's an allowance now for the, like exception number one, door closers, overhead door stops, power door operators, and electromagnetic doors shall be permitted to be 78 inches minimum above the floor. So charging section is talking about the projections into the clear opening and that projections into the clear opening with between 34 and 80 inches above the ground or floor shall not exceed four inches. So then there's the exception again for the the poor the poor the power door operators, door closers, and overhead door stops that can be that those can come down to 78 inches. Um, and then number two, that's not new, but for I2s and two ones, there shall be no projections into the clear width of doors used for the movement of better structure and the means of egress. But again, for the power operators. And electromagnetics, those can come down a little bit in 78 inches instead of the 80. Forces to unlatch and open doors. The, the main change is here uh, where the door hardware operates by rotation. The operational force to unlatch the door shall not exceed 28 inch pounds. Uh, that is for like a handle like this, a door like this. But while we're here, um, please remember that in the beginning of chapter 10 and then in 1010 10 for, for doors, it refers you to chapter 11 that and indicates that you also have to meet the requirements in chapter 11 and where that comes into play, one of the places it obviously comes into play all over the place for us, but with this section for door opening force, is this section says you can when you're for other than swinging doors sliding doors or folding doors and doors required to be fire rated the door shall require not more than 30 pound force to be set in motion and shall move to full open position when subject to not more than 15 pound force this isn't in, in compliance with chapter 11 so it has to be 15 and 15 and 15 unless it's a um it was well, it's, it's got to be the 15 pounds excuse me so Please keep that in mind. Some people forget that they just see this section, but please remember, or I should say this section, <laughs> but please remember to look at the beginning of 1010 and you also have to comply with the requirements of chapter 11 for accessibility. But anyway, the main change in that one I want to point out was the 28 inch pounds of rotational force for this type of, this is an example of that type of handle. And this is the standard it, it comes from, or is mimicking. Um, 
the locking locks and latches, so 10.10.2.4, 10, section for locks and latches, adds a little bit of language that matches with NFPA 101. When you have the, the locks on, like a, we don't do this, but we obviously have I2s. So for group I2 occupancies where the clinical needs of persons receiving care require containment or where persons receiving care pose a security threat, per, sorry, the charity section is saying you can have these. They can have them per, here provided that all clinical staff can readily unlock doors at all times and all such locks and are keyed to keys carried by clinical staff at all times, or all clinical staff have the codes or other means necessary to operate the locks at all times. And this is everybody, not just the staff on the, the unit or the floor, uh, not just nurses or doctors, but whoever, go, whatever staff's there, janitorial, housekeeping, um, the nutrition, whoever, whatever people are considered staff have to have this. And yes, this looks like a more of an operational thing and it's in building code, but think about if this isn't addressed here, they can't have those doors and they can't have them locked. So it does affect construction, even though it's more of an operational requirement. So that's why it's here. Similarly to like the requirements of having your nurses stations that are open to the corridor, uh, have to have supervision by direct supervision by staff even though that's more of an operational thing it is construction because if they don't have that in place they're going to have to construct that area completely differently so yes it looks operational but it can affect construction so that's why it's in the building code speaking of locks and latches and such for 10 10 to 5 for bolt locks Manually operated flush bolts or surface bolts are not permitted, and then there are exceptions. Manually operated edge and surface mounted bolts shall be permitted on the inactive leaf of pairs of doors that serve patient care rooms and I2 occupancies, provided, again, that word you gotta circle and make it stand out, they can have this as long as the bolts are self-latching and the inactive leaf is not needed to meet the minimum clear opening with required by 101011 of the building code, the 44 inches. The inactive leaf shall not contain doorknobs, panic bars, or similar operating hardware. So you often, you, you see this in your facilities, you've got your main door and then you've got the little, well, it's not always little, but <laughs> you have the, the leaf adjacent to it uh, to make it easier to get in and out of, that you can have that leaf and that door has to be 44 inches and you can have that leaf with a surface mounted or manual operated edge of, of bolt or surface bolt on there as long as those are self latching and you don't need that leaf to meet the 44. So this is in here just to, this isn't necessarily new either, but it sometimes causes confusion. Um, in the in the code like are we talking about doors have to latch and close and because of fire and the pressure differential we in the space can change with the fire and push those doors open we don't want that two different sections so these provisions here in exception five are concerned with the operation of the door hardware on egress doors and uh, as mentioned they're often misconstrued to be concerned with the opening protection issues of in 40731 that require the positive latching and then in uh, 10, 10244 and 101, which require the auto, those require the automatic flush bolts. So there's some confusion there. We just tried to make it to clean up, clean it up a little bit and to say that, yep, you've got the provisions of 101025, exception five to infirm, uh, affirm <laughs> the intent of exception five is to permit self-latching hardware on inactive leaves when the inactive leaf is not needed to provide the minimum clear opening with. So those little latches up at the top had to be self, self auto. Going back to refer, not back to, but uh, refrigeration machinery rooms larger than a thousand square feet have to have the two exit or exit access doorways that swing in the direction of egress travel and shall be equipped with panic hardware or fire exit hardware. So we already talked about how they have to swing in the direction of they have to have two of them. They have to swing in the direction of egress travel, but they also have to have panic hardware and fire exit hardware. 
So it, this, as you've heard, these sentences in two sections now. It's in 10.0622 and 10.10.29 because this is also addressing it in the section for panic and fire hardware. Similarly, for the electrical equipment, it's located in two places because it's the indicate, yep, those door, those areas have to have two means of egress when you've got this criteria in place. I'm not reading it only because it hasn't changed, but it's just showing you that, yes, it's in two places that you've got to have the two exits or exit access in these conditions, and those doors have to swing in the direction of egress, and they have to have panic hardware or fire exit hardware on those doors. And then, as I mentioned earlier today, the atriums that the exiting requirements for atriums have moved to 1017. Here, here's where it is. We can, um, let's see, we can read through these, I guess, quick. So the exit access travel distance for areas open to an atrium shall comply with the requirements of 1017, 321, 333, or 323. 321 says that egress not through the atrium where required access to exits is not through the atrium. Exit access travel distance shall comply with 1017-2. Where the path of egress travel is through an atrium space, exit access travel distance at the level of exit discharge shall be determined in accordance with 1017-2. Where you have the path of egress travel is not at the level of exit discharge from the atrium, that portion of the total permitted exit access travel distance that occurs within the atrium shall be not greater than 200 feet. And then of course for group I's as well as R21's, required means of egress from sleeping rooms and I's and R21's shall not pass to the atrium. So those provisions haven't changed when I2's are not allowed to exit through the atrium, but the location of the code requirements has changed to 1017 and they made it a little bit clearer for the other atrium requirement exiting requirements. And this is just a fix in the code that uh, model code doesn't require the one hour uh, corridors. In California we still have one hour corridors in our I2s when you have an occupant load greater than six. Just fixing that, clearing that up. W with table 1020, how wide do the corridors have to be? SFM was making some changes to 1020.3, and you'll see that in the mid cycle 19 as well. Uh, there was a little bit of a disconnect there and some confusion with the requirements that were published in the mid cycle 2019, and that was due to some changes that Building Standards Commission had. Uh, required to be made at the very last minute. <laughs> so there wasn't time to fix the code, so we fixed it in 2022. And what we did for a quick fix was add footnote A to the table for minimum corridor widths. For I2s, there are specific requirements in 1224.4.7.1 for I2s. Your, those requirements haven't changed. You know, you can, do you have to have eight feet or could you have six feet if it's psych with no uh, bed movement, what about office areas? Those those requirements haven't changed. We just put the um, point in here to go, or footnote here to you go see that spe for specifically for I2 and 1224.471. Dead ends. Uh, dead ends changed a little bit at the very end here. Where more than one exit or exit access doorways required, the exit access shall be arranged such that dead end corridors do not exceed 20 feet in length. That has not changed. Part of the exception has. In I2 and 21 occupancies, where the building is equipped throughout, so the whole building is sprinklered, the length of the dead end corridors that do not serve patient rooms or patient treatment spaces shall not exceed 30 feet. So don't just see 30 feet and you say dead ends and all oh, my dead ends can be 30 feet. They can only be 30 feet, one, if the whole building is sprinklered, and two, where those corridors do not serve patient rooms or patient treatment spaces. If they serve patient treatment spaces or patient rooms, it's still limited to 20 feet. If they don't and the building sprinklered, then you can go to 30. A little bit of a change for 1020.6 for the section for air movement and corridors. The charging section has not changed. That's indicating that corridors shall not serve as supply, return, exhaust, relief, or ventilation air ducts. 
What's been added here is number four, transfer air movement required to maintain the pressurization difference with, within healthcare facilities and group Ls. In accordance with ASHRAE 170, of course, ASHRAE 170, you go to our mechanical code, because again, this is a um, model code mainly change. So they refer to ASHRAE 170, go to our mechanical code, table four, with those and the footnotes in table four will say there's there's certain allowances for um, air movement through the corridors for certain rooms and and with certain limitations. This is referring to that. So go to CMC table four for the specifics. Basements and I2s um, is it's just relocated. Again, you can't have I2s in a basement. Uh, the information is moved from the exit access part of the code to the exit part of the code because we're specific, specifically talking about exits. So we moved it to the proper location. Exit passageways has uh, changed a, a little bit, um, not again in enforcement, but just making it clear that just like when we talked about earlier, we are, when you have an exterior wall on your, you've got your stair enclosure that's required to be a fire barrier, and you've got an exterior wall, does that wall have to be rated? Maybe, it depends. What does 705 say for exterior walls? And also, what about the, the angles? This, this language was added to exit passageways. It's been enforced that way, but it wasn't always made clear in the code, so now it's made clear in the code that yes, when you have the exterior wall and you've got the wall at angles less than 180 degrees, then it also needs to be protected. So do the openings, et cetera, but it's specific for the exit passageways. So similar language to exit stairs, but it's, this is for exit passageways. MCM, metal composite panels, we see these a lot. The code sections are not new for metal composite panels, that is in chapter 14 for your exterior walls, but it was kind of messy. So it's it's clarified a little bit. Uh, and it, it's, but pay attention to the type of construction. So when you're reading that 1406 and it's four metal composite materials, make sure you're reading the sections that's applicable to the building that you have. So since 140610 types one, two, three, and four construction, where the MCM's installed on these types of construction, they, it shall comply with 1406.10.1 and 10.2 for installations up to 40 feet. So this section is for types one, two, three, and four construction up to 40 feet above grade plane, where it's installed on one, two, three, and four construction. Uh, they it has they have to comply with 10.1 through 10.3 for installations greater than one than 40 feet. So if you're in this, these construction types and you have MCM and the buildings are up to 40 feet, they comply with 1406.10.1 and 10.2. More than 40 feet, they comply with 10.1 through 10.3. So you got one more section to comply with. And then for thermal barriers, uh, it's saying that MCM shall be separated from the interior of the building by approved thermal barrier consisting of half inch GIP or material that's tested in accordance with and meets the acceptable criteria for both the temp transmission fire test and integrity fire test. And then there's specific, I'm not gonna go through all this, but specific uh, requirements, specific tests and with NFPA 286, that if they meet those, they could comply with that instead. And then exception number two, if MCM is used on the uh, balconies and similar projections that they have different allowances for those. When you have foam plastic in the MCM, this is big to remember, those foam plastics have to comply with 2603. Please don't forget that. There's MCM systems with different types of uh, insulation. If they've got foam plastic in that insulation, you've also got to go to 2603. So just, in, and I'm sure you've seen these, you got the fires in the UK, Italy, the Middle East, and they're looking at this MCM a, a bit closer. And again, looking at the height of the building at 40 feet, up to 40 feet, above 40 feet type of construction, and then the requirements that go with that accordingly. Parapet walls in 1503, chapter 15, you, there are, the charging sections haven't really changed 
um, what they're what these are saying now is just saying that there's no requirement on the coping of a parapet to be non-combustible so like the very top of this doesn't have to be non-combustible um, it's usually there for weatherproofing but it has to be the same thickness of the parapet and it cannot decrease the fire resistance rating on the of the parapet as we talked about fuel line piping has new uh, testing requirements ul has a new standard for that uh, and there's also requirements for the separation for when you've got the generator inside the building and you've got fuel lines supplying that generator inside the building there are requirements for that to be pr protected and separated and adding the language for the new testing requirement ul 1489 it's just matt it also matches 403 that we already went through building services and uh, chapters 27 through 33. With, there's language in here that is when you have uh, emergency elevator, excuse me, when you have accessible elevators, there has to be an emergency elevator communication system. That type of system, that's not new, but that type of system has changed. It's, it's a little to meet more modern technology. Um, you've got so this is saying when you have the accessible elevator, you need to have the uh, emergency elevator communication system. What does that immune elevator, excuse me, emergency elevator communication system have to have? One, it's gotta be provided. The system shall provide visible text and audible modes that meet all of the following requirements. So when operating in each mode, it includes a live interaction system that allows back and forth conversation between the elevator occupants and the emergency personnel. It's operational when the elevator's, op when the elevator's operational and it allows elevator occupants to select the text-based or audible mode, depending on their communication needs in order to interact with the emergency personnel. So th the requirement for it to be there is not new, but the type of a system that has to be there now is modernized. That is new. It's not going to look like this anymore. Machine rooms, control rooms, machinery spaces, and control spaces. This isn't a change in the code. Um, this is just formatting to make it a little more clear that with these spaces have to be enclosed with fire barriers and there include the machine room control room control spaces and then machinery spaces outside of the hoistway enclosure those have to have fire barriers and we'll talk about see how fast i can do this with the sprinklers and the elevator shunt trip uh, let me just try to summarize it without all all this is here uh, there are a lot, you've seen the changes through the recent editions of the code starting from 2016 where there was an allowance for sprinklers to be removed from elevator hoistways if six conditions were met. What wasn't clear in the 16 code was that section in chapter 30 was only meant for machine roomless elevators, that you could only take the sprinklers out of those areas, of those types of hoistways uh, and put those six items in place. One of them included smoke detection. That wasn't clear that it was meant for machine machine roomless elevators that's all it was meant for it changed in mid-cycle 2016 to kind of clear that up it's changed again in 2022 of removing or excuse me it changed in mid-cycle 2019 it changed where you could remove the sprinklers from the hoistways of elevators uh, from the tops of the elevators you still need the sprinkler in the pit when you have a hydraulic elevator. So a machine room list type of elevator, like your Gen 4s, or excuse me, they're not called that, but your Gen 2s, uh, they have Gen 4s, but they don't call them that now, <laughs> where that elevator machinery is white right in the hoistway, the sprinkler can be re removed. Again, hydraulics, you need the sprinkler in the pit, but as far as smoke detection, don't forget that you still need smoke detection for recall. There are requirements in NFPA 72 and AS uh, and in 70, A17 requirements for the smoke detection for recall. So you still need the smoke detection for recall, um, even though if you don't need it because the sprinkler is gone, you still need it for recall. Please don't forget that. That's huge. And then the hoistway protection. Uh, 
where the where the uh, sorry I'm fading here <laughs> so are you probably where section 30062 requires protection of the elevator hoistway door opening the protection shall be provided by one of the following enclosed for SFM obviously this is number five one through four are not changed number five enclosed elevator lobbies are not required where the hoistway door has a fire protection rating as required by 7086 and the the hoistway door is protected by uh, smoke containment. So if this opens up into a corridor, it has to be protected. The door has to be protected uh, as required and the smoke containment in front of it. Uh, we're going more into Speedy Gonzales version here. We'll, we'll make it. We just have a few slides and half our, some of our pictures. Um, this is these are huge actually the buildings under construction and you'll see this in chapter 33 requirements for water supply there are more specific requirements for water supply in buildings under construction they need an approved water supply for fire protection either temporary or permanent as soon as combustible materials arrive on site that's big not your trailer don't worry about your trailer but as soon as the building materials arrive on site approved water supply must be provided as well as on commencement of vertical combustible construction and on installation of a standpipe system in buildings under construction of course with uh, 33 13 2 and 5 if there's a reduction in the required water supply uh, then that has to be that has to go through the fire authority so it'll be going through us and we'll be communicating with locals if they're okay with it. What is the minimum the com when the combustible building materials of the building under construction are delivered to a site, a minimum fire flow of 500 gallons per minute shall be provided. The fire hydrant used to provide this flow shall be within 500 feet of the combustible building materials as measured along an approved fire apparatus lane. And then where the sites can, where the site configuration is such that only one hydrant can be located within 500 feet of all combustible materials, additional hydrants shall be required to provide coverage in accordance with this section. So again, you need a water supply as soon as combustible materials are delivered to the site. And then for vertical construction for types 3, 4, and 5 construction, prior to commencement of vertical construction of these types that utilize any combustible building materials, then you need the water supply. And then uh, you also need set fire separation of up to 30 feet when you're in types when you're constructing three, four, five type construction. They've got to have a fire separation distance of not uh, if they've got less than 30 feet of property lines and adjacent property has existing structure or otherwise can be built on, then they have to have the water supply again, the five a minimum 500 GPM or the entire fire flow required for the building when constructed, whichever is greater. So they're gonna need the minimum of the 500 or whatever the entire need is for when the building's constructed, whichever one's greater. And then again, your separation of 30 feet up to 60, where you've got the same types, three, four, and five, and they have a fire separation distance of 30 feet up to 60 from the lot line, the adjacent property can be built on, then they need the, the minimum of the 500 gallons per minute or the maximum flow of what the whole building needs once it's constructed. And if they've got separation of 60 feet or greater, then they can just have the 500 gallons per minute. And then for vertical construction for types one and two construction, if you've got combustible mater building materials delivered, again, you need the, you need the water supply. And standpipe, regardless of the presence of materials, you need the standpipe uh, where it's required in 3313 with the 500. And then the hydrant has to be within 100 feet of the fire department con connection supplying the standpipe. They, this, these are big changes. And if, uh, we've seen enough in the news lately about construction, and not even lately, but for a long, long time about construction sites catching fire. Now they're being more stringent about getting that water supply to the construction sites. Again, when that combustible building material is delivered. Reference standards, I know we're in our last two minutes here, but we will be, we will be
fine. Go look at chapter 35 in CBC and in chapter 80 CFC for the current, uh, what will be current, adopted, adopted editions of the reference standards. We're, for 13 and 72, we are jumping to the 2022 edition. Uh, we are in the 2016 edition and in the 2019 code because of the print delays for NFPA but we will be jumping to the 2022 editions. And as always, when you're looking at your reference standards, make sure you're looking at the right edition. One last thing, positive, positive alarm sequence, just like pre-signal, they're not just like, they're two different things. But, and what is similar is we do not allow positive alarm sequence uh, in our facilities, in our in I2s. All right, we made it, it's not even 1201. All right, that is it. Thank you very, very much. That was a lot of information. And there'll be more to come with uh, CFC. We'll do another presentation for that. Great, thank you, Nancy. Thank that, you. that was a great presentation. That was a lot of information, a lot of code changes and lots of code sections. So we hope you found this webinar to be helpful. Remember, if you didn't download the PDF handouts, you can access them under the handout section of the GoTo toolbox under your GoTo uh, to a tool there. So go ahead and download those if you haven't done so already. Um, a lot of code sections I was trying to keep up and that I just downloaded the handouts just to have that uh, accessible. So if you do have a question, I know that some of you did, uh, send that email over to regsunit at hki.ca.gov. Again, that's R-E-G-S-U-N-I-T at hki ca.gov. If you are interested in joining us for part three of this uh, this whole uh, series, you can do so by clicking that link that we provided you in the chat section, uh, which will send you over to the HKI website under the webinar section under training and development. So feel free to do so. If you if you can't if you can't get to, to that link or open it, send us an email. We'd be happy to send that link directly to you. Um, again, it's been a pleasure being with you uh, here today. Thank you for what you do and doing your part in providing access to safe, quality healthcare environments throughout the state of California. Thank you and be safe. Thank you, Susan, and everybody. <laughs>